We are at a session called Pennsylvania's Inclusive Post-Secondary Education Programs, Inspiring Success. We have a panel of four or five people here from different universities and colleges who will talk a little bit about the program. And if you've been here before, has anyone been to this session before in the past couple of years? If you have been, you know that each university um, spokesperson got up and said a few things about the program, um, and it got a little bit repetitive. Because a lot of programs are very, very similar, although they're all very unique in their own way. A lot of the nuts and bolts are very similar. So this year we tried to um, have each, each speaker talk about the highlights and success stories and really unique things about the program and then put all of the redundant basic information is very repetitive on a handout up here. We'll give those out to you later. You can take them back with you. It has all the contact information, all the details, which we're not going to get into. We'd rather have it more of a dialogue and a little bit more positive and upbeat and successful storytelling rather than having a nuts and bolts about their unique programs. If that's okay, we'll get started. My name is Bob Arnhold, and I um, was with Slippery Rock University until December. I retired after 32 and a half years, and I was a professor of adapted physical activity and ran the grad program for a long time there. And I got a little bit tired of that about five years ago. Not tired of it, but I get I guess I get a little hyper and want to move on to something new. So we started Rock Life. It's a post-secondary program at Slippery Rock, and we're in our third or fourth year now. Um, but I've given that up, and I'm standing up here today representing Dream Partnership. And you'll hear a little bit about Dream in a minute, but Dream um, funds all the universities you'll hear today um, talk about their programs. They funded startup monies to each of the universities to begin a post-secondary ed program. And that's kind of the background of why we're here. It's a DREAM-funded program. So the director of DREAM, you'll see a little bit later, is Jeffrey Cooper. He's interim director. Um, Nancy Shirley is the administrative director, and they're both out of town. And Jordan Nab is a consultant out of Florida, and he wasn't able to be here. So I was the fourth in line to help out, so that's why I'm here today. So I'd like to know a little bit about um, who is in the audience, so we know kind of what populations we're speaking to. First of all, do we have parents in the audience? Okay, very excellent, very good. I hope you can pick up some things um, from all these different schools, probably one at least around you. Uh, college folks, university people, okay. School district people, uh, Patton or IU folks, good. And I know I missed a bunch, who else did I miss? Youth. You, youth, how many? How many people are looking for a, a college to go to? There you go, perfect. Well, we have one for you. Either if you want to stay near home, you can go to one near your house or get as far away from your folks as you want to and go clear across the state probably. So we'll, we'll be good. All right, so we're gonna get started here. I'll do a couple slides to introduce the programs in the background and we'll go into our, our speakers. So in 2012, Dream Partnership was formed by parents and professionals out of Central Pennsylvania, Camp Hill, PA, and they received a large grant from the um, Office of Vocational Rehab to fund startup monies for different colleges across Pennsylvania to, to start post-secondary experiences, either at the community college, college, or university level. And so far, I believe they've funded probably nine or 10 different universities from Erie all the way down to Philly and from up in the Northeast, the Poconos down to Pittsburgh. So all over the state and everywhere in between. In 2019, um, Dream moved from United Cerebral Palsy offices in Camp Hill to their own facility, also in Camp Hill, but now they're their own identi identity and they're not connected with UCP anymore for a lot of different reasons, but that's good for Dream right now. Uh, Dream has very specific objectives and you can see on the board, provide startup funding to colleges of higher education, build the knowledge, skills, and capabilities of college to, pro to pro provide post-secondary education where simultaneously generating awareness among consumers, family members, educators, and the community. And I'll tell you from um, personal experiences, the most uh, valuable thing that Dream ever did was provide technical assistance to us at Slippery Rock when we were just getting started. You call up Sherry Landis or whoever at the offices and they always provided a, really a very valuable information about the good and the bad ideas you were thinking about starting a program. So they were very valuable as, as technical assistance. And provide scholarship opportunities for students with intellectual disabilities. They funded thousands and thousands of dollars through a 
a fundraiser event they do every year in Camp Hill, and they've given a lot of scholarships out to students to help pay for tuition and books and room and board and other things that um, cost so much money going to college. And those monies are still available for students attending any of the Dream Partnership schools. In order to apply for the grants, you have to have um, an academic component at your university, inclusive classroom experiences, access to dormitory living or thinking about moving in that direction down the road. They didn't require that to be a mandatory requirement early on, but at least you should think in that direction of some sort of dormitory on or off campus setting. Um, campus and community offering diverse of extracurricular activities, social activities, sports, cultural events, etc., and opportunities to pursue education, uh, employment either through internships or, or job secured positions after or during college. Those are some of the universities located in the different counties across Pennsylvania. And in just a second, we'll start by introducing people from Arcadia. Duquesne is not able to be here today. They're starting up a program in the fall with uh, three or four new students in the Duquesne University area in Pittsburgh. Penn State Harrisburg has been one of the old time folks doing this work. They are, they are here today. Um, Penn State uh, main campus is starting a program shortly. They're not here, but they're in the development phase and they've received dream money, dream monies. Temple University is here today. Westchester just um, started their program, non-residential, and I'll talk a little bit about that for them. And then Slippery Rock University will wrap it up here at the end of the session. Each university will have 10 to 15 minutes to present their unique and successful stories about the program. And most of those schools have a two-page, two-sided, one-page handout for you to take with you. And if they haven't been able to provide that to me, their contact information is available and I'll give you that information to call or email or text them for that flyer. After the session is um, completed by all the presenters, we'll open up for questions and answers to any of the panels or all the panel members. Okay, with that um, said, we'll introduce Simon Moore, who's representing Arcadia University. Simon? Hello, everyone. My name is Simon Moore, and I am the coordinator of the Real Certificate Program. Just a real brief, brief overview of our program, and you can read more about it in our handout. We are a two-year comprehensive transition program, and we serve students with intellectual and developmental disabilities between the ages of 18 and 25. So the first uh, major success story and highlight I really want to talk about is we've been really focusing on becoming as inclusive as possible. We've always offered inclusive class options as well as vocational internships and competitive employment opportunities. But over the last year, we've really worked on refining our person-centered planning process to be able to identify students' long-term goals in employment as well as in education so that we can find the best fits and connect with the most relevant professors to be able to promote their long-term goals. Students typically take two courses each semester, whether that's related to their long-term employment goals, such as criminal justice, education, and I'll talk about some employment outcomes towards the end of my presentation, or in their interests. Many students come to our program and have been in restricted classrooms in high school and are not very familiar with different opportunities like criminal justice or English or poetry, and they want to take a range of different class options to just be exposed to a lot of the different disciplines. A big thing we've also worked is improving our employment. So we've worked with many community members either on, on our campus. We're a very small, pretty campus. We have a gorgeous castle. I'm not sure if there's a picture of the castle on the flyer, but it's really pretty. I hope you come visit it sometime. Um, and with our local community, community members, either in Philadelphia or in Montgomery County, we've worked with a lot of different OVR agencies to be able to find competitive employment options for our students and we're mainly focusing on finding options that are in our students' field of interest. And finally, we've worked with peer mentors to create as inclusive experience as possible. We've really focused on recruiting uh, mentors that are interested in the field of working with individuals with disabilities, 
being able to retain them by collecting information and hearing their feedback as well as our students' feedback to be able to improve the mentoring experience. We have both social and academic mentors that work with our students to either help engage with the campus community or um, to work on campus assignments and work such as that. And then our biggest highlight that I want to share with you is that in the next year we have expanded to offering study abroad. Arcadia is a major international university and we have campuses all over the world as well as we send 80% of our students to foreign countries. So now this opportunity is available to our students as well as we finally expanded to a residential component, which I'll talk more about in the next slides. So Arcadia, which is a big draw for anyone that's interested in coming to Arcadia, about 90% of students participate in our preview experience. Preview is a course that first year students take during their um, first, year, uh, first year in their second semester, where they learn about a different community and different culture around the world. We have about 20 different options, ranging from Saudi Arabia to Rome to uh, different parts of South America. Vietnam is when I really want one of our students to go because I want to travel to Vietnam. <laughs> one of my long-term dreams, 20-something hour flight, no big deal. But sadly, none of our students have been interested in that so far. London, Paris, and Rome seems more interesting, I guess. Okay. So we've really worked with our international office to make this as an opportunity for our students because if everyone else coming into the university all these first years, they pick to come to Arcadia because they want to do this, we strongly believe our students should have this opportunity as well. So we really work to identify specific supports that our students would need, identifying the application process and how we could help support our students with the traditional application process. And last year, we finally made this happen and we made it um, a reality. One of our students completed the application process in our, their first year, but she decided that she was not um, interested in going at that time. We now have five incoming students, and three of them have identified that they want to either study in Rome or London or Paris, the three big options now. And we are really excited to help support them through the application process, helping them find funding to be able to attend the trip. It's $595, and that is a very good price to travel abroad to Europe, just saying. But we want to make sure that it's accessible to all our students, not just those with the financial means. So we're working to identify scholarship options, which our university does provide. So we're really excited for that. And maybe I'll be able to be one of the co-instructors on the course and get to go as well. Cross my fingers. And then next, housing. Well, I've worked at Arcadia for the last, uh, this is my going into my fourth year. And well before I started here, since 2013, we have been working towards having a residential component. We've received a lot of pushback from our university. But with the change in administration and more supportive uh, administrators coming in, we've been able to work with them, and we finally are going to have a housing program. And we're really excited for that. Woohoo! We have uh, four incoming, four out of our five incoming students will be living on campus in two separate uh, halls. So we're really excited for them because that will provide them even more opportunities to engage in the community. Many of our clubs are in the evening, and when students go home and leave, they don't want to come back three hours later to go to a club. But now that they're living here, they'll have the opportunity to see more of the club options, as well as go to many of the events on the weekends, which have always been available to our students. And, but many of our students have chosen not to go for that reason of coming back and forth and transportation difficulties. So we're really excited about housing. It's not a requirement for our students, but it's an opportunity, and we're really excited that we'll be starting this in the fall. And cross my fingers again, hopefully it goes really well. And the last thing I want to talk about is I want to share some employment outcomes, a big goal for anyone going to college. You go to college to find yourself, of course, learn more about yourself, develop your identity. But employment's a big part. We really spend all this money because we want to get a job. So a big thing I want to share with you is a couple quick employment stories and how we've worked with these students to have really successful outcomes. Out of um, three, three out of three, so 100% of our graduating class from this year will be either going into continuing their education or into uh, competitive employment positions. So we're really excited about that. 
So the first story I want to share is a young woman who was very interested when she first came to our program a few years ago that she wanted to work in childcare. She didn't want to directly be a teacher, but she knew she wanted to work with children. So we worked with her in our person-centered planning process to identify courses such as youth and development and other child-related services classes that she could take to improve her understanding. In, in her internship, we were able to find a local preschool that she was able to volunteer in, where she gained a lot of valuable experience working with students. In her second year, we worked with OVR to be able to find a employment position at the YMCA, which she absolutely loves and has worked there for the last three years. Once she graduated about two years ago, we worked with OVR to make sure that she could expand the hours that she works there. And now she's working between 20 and 30 hours a week there, and she loves her position. And she plans to only continue. So we're really proud of her and excited. Next, uh, one of our recent graduates, she had the goal of being a teacher. When she came in, she said, I don't want to work with, I don't want to just work with children. I don't want to just be um, a babysitter. I want to work in a school, and I want to work as a teacher. And we said that's a really awesome goal. We reviewed a lot of the uh, requirements for being a teacher, and we were able to identify that assistant teacher role would be um, a realistic opportunity for her. So she did many things. She took many education courses throughout her time at Arcadia. She really worked with professors. She had an internship where she volunteered at a preschool in our local community for over two years. And then during her final year, we spent a long time finding a lot of applications, applying to multiple, multiple preschools. I spent quite a few hours staying up with her, um, finishing these applications, and attending these interviews with her. But right before graduation, she finally was hired. And we're really, really excited about that because she really loves the school that she's hired in. And she is an assistant teacher in a preschool class for students between the ages of three and four. So it's her yeah. ideal fit. And we're really happy that she's there. And, within the, and she's in a six-month trial period. And once that six-month period is over, she should be um, considered a full-time employee receiving benefits and um, working between 37.5 and 40 hours a week. So we're really happy for her. And congratulations. Um, finally, another one of our recent graduates, his goal is he wanted to work in social work. We looked at the requirements, and he shared that he really wants to work in social work. He understands that it requires a college degree, and that that is a challenge. So with that him, we work to identify courses that would be introductory in college courses to any traditional university to meet those prereqs that anyone that attends college, I'm sure, groaned over having to take introductory to psychology and introductory to sociology over and over again. So we work to help identify those courses and work with him to identify tutors and make sure that he was meeting the standards and that he would be able to attend a community college. Uh, this year, we worked with him to identify all the steps to applying to a community college. He applied to his local community college. He was accepted in many hours taking the practice entrance exams. He completed them and scored very high. So we're really excited about that. And he will be starting in the fall. So he'll be taking his first couple of courses, those introductory algebra and so forth and so forth. So we're really proud of him. And I can't wait to keep checking in and hoping that he achieves all his goals to achieve his associates and moves on to a four-year university. Awesome. So those are just three of our big success stories. We've had quite a few. We're proud of all our recent graduates, all our graduates that have ever completed our program. But I just want to share those three stories with you. Finally, this is uh, my specific contact information. Uh, I'm Simon Moore. I'm the coordinator. And our uh, director is Jessica Mattis. Some of you may have met her before. She's a wonderful resource. And um, if you're interested in applying to our program, you can request our application. All this information is on our worksheet. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. So please feel free. Email me anytime, especially students if you're here and want to learn more about programs. I'm more than happy to interact with you, answer any questions. So thank you for having me. Sure. Does anyone have any real specific questions about our program? Yes. What are your admission requirements? So our admissions criteria is hopefully on here, is on our admission guideline, is on our worksheet. 
A uh, major factor is students between the ages. Our st uh, major criteria are that students between the ages of 18 and 25 are not eligible to meet acceptance criteria at that time. So if a student has is taken the SATs, ACTs, and would be able to attend a community college, we are not the right program because our students are not achieving college credits in our program. And there's a few others, but they all should be on the list. Yes? For our program, uh, st our students who are a pilot program are living together. We have four students living on two separate halls. We have five halls. So each student, all four are female, and two are living together, and two are living together. Yeah. Supports, uh, we have support. We have a mentoring system that students are available. I'm not sure the exact hours. I think it's six to eight. So if a student needs help going to a club or eating lunch or help with homework between those hours, we have that support. And then we have a traditional on-call system with the resident assistant. And then there's like first responders, third responders, which is the traditional support system. Yes? I have a year-round Unfortunately, our facilities are not available year-round. They close in the summer. Arcadia is a very old university, and we are constantly renovating the dorms, so they close in the summer. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, you asked if Arcadia has an autism support program at the university. We are currently working towards that. Uh, our chair of education, that is one of her major goals, but we do not currently offer that at the moment. I can say Westchester University, uh, DCAP has a program, in Drexel, of course. Those are the only two I'm familiar with. Any other questions? Go ahead. Go ahead. What kind of courses are you offering? Like, um, if they're not college courses, what is it really learning? Um, you asked what type of courses and students take. I have an English disability, so like a traditional college, like a, all, like, <coughs> it would be difficult for her to take um, a college level course. So are these college level courses, or what exactly are they? So our students take fully inclusive college level 100 and 200 level courses, which are first year, second year. We modify the work to each student's individual ability. So are they auditing? They are auditing the course. They're not taking it for credit. So they're not receiving a goal. They're not receiving a grade. They have between three to five goals in each course that they're working towards. One more? One more? Yes? Are your uh, mentors primarily volunteers? Our mentors are primarily volunteers, and we have about 10 student workers that work with our program. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And I did switch up the rules of the game here by letting people with very specific questions, um, ask them immediately after the speaker, and then more generic questions we'll have at the end still. But if you have something burning that that person said about that session, you can ask that immediately afterwards when they're done speaking. So we'll open up the rules a little bit for that. Um, the next speaker, I thought that was very interesting, um, some of the points you brought up, which were unique, because you've been around a long time, um, Arcadia has doing this work, so very nice job. Next speaker is Aaron Metzinger from Temple University. Just not quite as tall as he is. Um, all right, well, so good morning. Uh, like you said, I'm Aaron Metzinger, and I'm from Temple University. I'm here to talk about our leadership and career studies program that we have. And I am the academic relations coordinator for the program. I've been there since about November. All right, so we are a four-year program. We were previously a two-year program. This, we are entering our third year as this being a four-year program. Currently including the freshman students that will be coming in August, we have 24 students enrolled. 
our first group of seniors will be graduating in 2021. Um, so like Arcadia, our students are auditing all inclusive classrooms. They are taking classes with matriculated Temple students. Over the course of four years, they're going to take 12 elective courses and then four core classes that are required through our program. I'll touch a little bit, uh, touch a little bit on that a little, in a couple of minutes, um, why that's important. But with those 12 elective courses, they are based on the students' interests. So they are telling us what they're interested in. Uh, picking specific classes that they want to take, and then we're going to work to enroll them in those classes. And so with each of those classes, they do get what's called an accommodation plan. That is something that I write for them. The accommodation plan takes the syllabus and just helps them, um, kind of takes the syllabus and meets them where they're able to succeed. Uh, we work pretty closely with the professors to make sure that they're getting what's most important out of the class. We don't want to take anything away from the class. Um, so I do have just a couple examples as to how that accommodation plan might work. So a six-page paper might become a two-page summary. An oral presentation may be a PowerPoint presentation that's presented to the class instead. Um, and then with all exams, students are offered extended time if they need to or an alternate space to take that exam if they need less distractions. Um, I would say the key thing about the accommodation plans is that they are a fluid document. They can change throughout the semester. If something isn't working, we really want to work to make sure that we can change that and make it work best for the student and the class that they're taking. So as I mentioned, we were previously a two-year program. We're now a four-year program. One of the things that did change for us is the fact that we now have student coaches. Previously, we had student mentors. Each mentor was assigned to a student for specific tasks, um, specific parts of that student's experience. With the student coaches, they are responsible for all parts of that student's experience on campus. Um, so if they may be assigned just to go to math class with the student, they're still going to be pretty well aware of everything else that the student is doing, whether it's a social activity or a different class that they're attending in a maybe different part of the week or a different part of the day. The student coaches are part of a team for that student. Every student has about three or four student coaches that are assigned to them. They are Temple University staff. They, this is their part-time job while they're going to school on campus. Uh, they go through the same hiring processes that we do. Um, and really, they're there to support all aspects of that student's experience on campus, uh, whether it be going to class, attending a club, attending a basketball game, um, really whatever that student needs. And so because we changed this to really creating a team for the student, uh, what we started with this four-year program were a circle of support meetings. These circle of support meetings are really meant to be student-led. The main purpose of these meetings is for the student to meet with their coaches, all of their coaches, once a month, uh, talk about what's working, talk about what's not working, uh, any challenging uh, issues that they may be facing in class, uh, anything that they're having trouble with outside of class, um, and really teaching that self-direction. We find that after a couple of months of leading the meetings, the students become a lot more confident in working with the coaches and really telling them what's working for them, what's not working for them. Um, hopefully, if they need less support in a class, they'll communicate that to their coaches as well. And really offers them an opportunity to resolve any conflicts or issues that they may be having before coming to our Temple University staff. Um, and really trying to make that something that they're leading with their coaches. Another thing that we've implemented with our four-year program are enrichment sessions. This is in addition to the classes that they're auditing on campus. Enrichment sessions are going to be either bi-weekly for our freshmen, or they're going to be monthly for our sophomores, juniors, and soon-to-be seniors. And enrichment sessions will cover a variety of topics, conversations, anything from money management to safe relationships, bullying, self-advocacy, rights and responsibilities. Uh, because our program, Leadership and Career Studies, is based out of Temple's Institute on Disabilities, we have a plethora of staff who are experts in all different types of topics. Um, we've had staff come in and talk about bullying. We've had staff come in and talk about um, safe sex relationships. So these can be taught by either myself or our particular program, or we can bring in outside staff to help out with that as well. Um, it's also a really nice way for the cohorts 
to meet with each other on a biweekly or monthly basis also, a way for us to sort of touch base with the students and see if there's any um, overarching issues that they all may be facing. Um, also a nice way for the students to make sure that they're all getting together once a month or biweekly uh, to talk to each other and see what's working for them and what's not working as well. And so one of the most important things that we're working towards with our students is the availability for them to take classes for credit if they so choose. Um, so I mentioned that our students audit the classes. They're going to audit about three classes a semester. But I also mentioned those four core classes that they will take as a part of our program. Temple University offers a diversity and inclusion certificate. It's a set of four classes that can be taken over a period of time. And if these classes are taken for credit and passed, you then achieve this diversity and inclusion certificate. Uh, so we don't have any students in, our, in their freshman year that will take classes for credit. We try to help transition them smoothly, help them make that transition from high school or whatever they might have been doing prior to coming to Temple, helping them getting used to uh, being on campus, doing homework, and all of that stuff. Uh, but after their freshman year, if they're interested in taking a class for credit, we would encourage them to choose one of those four classes that we had mentioned. And those classes cover uh, topics such as leadership and communication, um, understanding urban communities because Temple is located in Philadelphia in an urban community, um, introduction to inclusive education, and interpersonal communications. And so when students want to take a class for credit, those are the courses that we would encourage them to take. They'll still get support from our program. They still get a student coach. The biggest difference is that they're also being supported by disability resource services on our campus as well. Um, and that's who's going to provide them their support plan for the class. So they're getting all of those supports from us, but they are definitely responsible for more of the work in class. Um, and they are getting a letter grade for that class as well. The professor is aware that they are registered with Disability Resource Services um, and then would be assigning a grade for that student. We have successfully had two students take classes for credit and the hope is that over the next four years, they'll take those last three core classes to achieve this diversity and inclusion certificate. Um, so that's just a very basic overview. Uh, I am the academic relations coordinator, so I'm the person that does a lot of the working with the professors. I would say one of the most important, uh, great aspects about our program is that we have a lot of professors that support our program and take our students in their classes each semester. Um, so that's just kind of an overview of my role. We also have our director, Kathy Miller, uh, who has been with our program for many years. Uh, she's also a great point of contact if you had any questions. Titania Bodie, who is our project manager, uh, she's my supervisor, also with our program for quite a, quite, a, uh, quite a few years. And then our student supports coordinator, Jack Badger, who recruits, hires, and works with our student coaches in our program. If anyone has questions, would you please repeat them for the folks? Sure. Any specific questions about Temple's program? Sure. So currently all of our students, uh, so you asked uh, you know, how our students would pay for the program either privately uh, or funded or through grants. Uh, currently all of our students are receiving what's called the waiver for our program um, and that's how they are paying for those classes. We don't currently have any students that are paying that full tuition. Um, so the waiver is something that they would work with their supports coordinator to apply for and then that's how they pay for the classes. Um, but I will, I will just add that if a student wanted to live on campus, we don't currently have any residential facilities that are just for our program. The waiver would not cover residential services. Through waiver services, you still have to go and apply through FAFSA and FIA and all those things before waiver funds can kick in. Is that correct? Because waiver is payer of last resort? Yes, so through waiver services, you would still apply for FAFSA, yes. Yes. Are students able to take classes for credit that are outside those four core classes that you referred to? So are students able to take classes for credit outside of those core classes? They are. We encourage this only because it does help them build towards another certificate. But if a student was uh, interested in taking, uh, you know, whether it's a dance class or a sports class for credit, uh, we would certainly work with them to have them take that class for credit as well. Any other specific questions about Temple University's program?
Thank you, Aaron. Okay. Mercyhurst is the next school I'm going to talk about just for a minute or two. I don't claim to know much about Mercyhurst program, um, but if you have information or if you have questions, I should say, about their programs, I can give you some contact information. It's on the slides at the end, I believe. Um, Mercy, Mercyhurst Oasis program is a one or two year program for adults with um, documented ID or developmental disabilities. Um, it's on the Northeast campus. They've been around for, I believe, five or six years. They've been pretty well established, um, especially their autism program. Um, students enrolled, um, attending existing college courses, fully inclusive. And they're expected to um, engage in all the coursework they can, much like the other universities. Um, even though students are auditing courses, they're, they're encouraged to uh, participate in as much of the class assignments with assistance as they can and turn in assignments. And I'm sure Mercyhurst, like other schools, has um, contacts with the professors at those universities teaching those courses to explain, because most faculty around the campus don't always understand or even know of the program, like Rock Life or Mercyhurst or Temple's program on campus. So um, they meet with the professors beforehand and explain um, what their program's about, any accommodations necessary, or if a student's auditing, what um, is expected of that student. And they have, of course, social activities, um, residential, assist, residential living with a grad assistant um, supervising um, the residential um, programs along with the RAs or resident assistants. And you can see um, some of the coursework on the bottom there, computer applications, basic math, critical writing, pretty typical of most colleges offering post-secondary. A lot of the uh, freshman orientation classes are basic skills courses. And they do focus on hospitality and I believe um, some nursing. Here's some options for funding. I believe, I, I believe most of the universities, if not all by now, are CTPs or comprehensive transition programs certified by the U.S. Department of Education. And when a school is designated a CTP, that means families and students can um, accept Pell Grants or uh, receive student federal work money jobs on campus if the school is a CTP. And that was it. I'm sorry I don't know much more about Mercy Harris, but I'll have the contact information for you later for the director and the emails and telephone numbers. Um, next up is Pennsylvania State Harrisburg campus with uh, Danielle Lee and Brenda Firestone. So I have an assistant today, aren't I lucky? Is it gonna be a pain? Oh, it's, she can do the heavy lifting, check it out, great. Um, so I just introduced myself again, I am Brenda Firestone. I am the co-director of the program at Penn State Harrisburg, the Career Studies Program and Danielle is our program coordinator. She's gonna assist me to click through our slides. Don't be alarmed, I'm gonna click through a lot of slides because frankly, I didn't have time to pare down my presentation and I know that um, time is limited. But all of the information or most of the important information will be on that handout and additionally, um, there's the link to our website, which has a lot more information, and then the contact information, particularly for our esteemed director of the program, Dr. Linda Wren, who's really the glue that holds us all together, so. Go ahead and click. Click. Um, so our program is a two-year 
four semester program. Students um, focus on really three cores. One is academic enrichment and um, the other, the social enrichment, um, the inclusive higher education piece. We've got a career development, career exploration piece. And then um, the final piece is a National Retail Foundation credential um, that our students have the opportunity to get. Um, our students are, again, as most of the programs, typically between the ages of 18 and 25. Um, we do require documentation of intellectual disability or other disability, and that is all outlined in the application process. Go ahead and click. Um, can you go back one? There. Um, so our program does offer two um, very specific credentials. Students who successfully complete the four semesters, two years, will receive a career study certificate from Penn State. Additionally, as I had mentioned, um, our students do engage in a national curriculum from the National Retail Foundation called Retail Industry Fundamentals. And that curriculum is very focused towards customer service, job skills, employment skills, how to interact with people in, um, in, in the work environment, those sorts of things. As the students move through the curriculum, they take a series of exams, and if they are successful in passing those exams, they then will receive a national um, certification a credential in retail industry fundamentals. Okay, go ahead. Click. Um, as with almost all the other programs, our students are heavily supported by peer mentors on campus. Our peer mentors come from all of the academic areas on campus. We did start with sort of the teacher education, special education degree type programs, um, but that just blossomed primarily through word of mouth from other peer mentors as well as our faculty. And we now have peer mentors serving with the program from all of the academic disciplines, including science, engineering, and technology, business, um, public affairs, et cetera. Um, our peer mentors do get paid to participate in the program. They are part-time. Um, they go through all the employment processes as every other Penn State um, employee, employee would have to do. Um, and those peer mentors assist with the academic and the social support. Um, our students are admitted in the fall, again, with the handout. You can get on the website. It outlines all of the, um, the requirements. Um, just FYI, uh, typical program fees. This would include um, the one academic course that three credit course that all our students are required to take. Our students do um, audit the classes. It would include the career studies piece, which is the National Retail Foundation um, and transition curriculum that it also includes the um, career development and exploration piece that includes an external um, contracting with uh, job coaches and um, that vocational support. Typically, it's about $8,600 um, per semester. Um, go ahead. Uh, again, most of our students are also uh, pay through their waiver. Um, some of our students are private pay as well. Um, go ahead. And go ahead. And go ahead. Um, we accept applications all year round, sort of on a revolving basis. We do encourage people to apply as soon as possible, um, depending on what academic year they're in. So for what's coming up, we're in the academic 2019-2020 year. We started reviewing applications for 2019-2020 in the fall and through the spring. We very uh, highly recommend that if you're considering 
um, applying for any of these types of programs that you do start early. Um, you do apply for the FAFSA. The deadline for the FAFSA, I believe, for everybody is May 1st. Um, of that ap academic year, and you cannot access your waiver funds unless you have submitted the FAFSA. So even if you're kind of on the fence or not sure, that is something that through that transition um, you should be doing or encouraged to be doing. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, again, we do a lot of person-centered planning. A lot of our um, programming with our students is very individualized. The students come in um, before the semester starts. We go through a whole, of course, it's Penn State, so we call it lion tracks, and we've got the lion on the front of the, 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 uh, the handout. Um, but we are very serious about making sure that our um, uh, program for our student is very individualized, and we find out what's the best um, place for our students and how the, our students best transition through our curriculum. Go ahead. Again, um, our students um, are required to take at least one three credit class. Um, the students do audit the classes. Um, as the students move through the semester, they typically you know, will increase that academic um, portion of the class. We typically have students taking two, even three um, academic classes by the time they get to their fourth semester. All of our students make appointments with the disability services on campus. Um, they all go um, through an appointment with, with, with that office. They get their accommodations letter that they share with um, the faculty and the courses that they're attending. And then in addition to that, uh, the peer mentor, the program coordinator, and the student will work with the faculty to modify the assignments um, so that, again, similar to what Simon was saying, if there's you know four exams and two presentations, we'll encourage the student to look at what those requirements are and to modify them to what makes sense, and they get the most out of that course in the best experience. So they might attempt to do um, one exam or maybe break it down into three quizzes and then do a presentation. Go ahead. So these are some examples. Um, as the students move through, we do encourage them to take some kinesiology classes to promote a health and wellness. Um, but again, most kinesiology classes are one and a half credits, so that doesn't meet that three credit requirement. Um, and so that would be like their secondary class. But our students have taken, you know, um, a lot of the gen eds, the history courses, they absolutely love American studies courses, are very enriched in learning about other cultures. Um, we have one student who has really excelled in the art area and has just um, continued from drawing to painting to sculpture. Uh, so it's been, uh, it's been a great experience. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I did mention this NRF class. Um, it's a national, um, national retail foundation. Um, we, we currently are using the online uh, retail industry fundamentals, which means that each of our students get access to the online portal, but we teach the class in the classroom. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. Students can access that at home or on their off time and look through the curriculum over and over again, but they also get personalized instruction in in the front of the classroom, so go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. Um, our students, um, as they go through the program, we sort of um, start out high in the academic and that um, the transition and the National Retail Foundation curriculum, and then that kind of eases off. They basically 
um, are taking their exams in the se spring, so the second semest semester. They do have the opportunity to do that in the fall as well. Um, but then once they do that, then that piece goes away and we start to build up that vocational piece. So they start off doing career field trips where we narrow down their personal interests. Um, we continue that in the spring, but we might do some individual um, career exploration. And then be beginning the third semester, they get placed in individual practicums. And the last semester, the expectation is they're basically at least two days a week out in the community or at a work so site um, on their practicum and taking academic courses. Um, some of the places that they've job shadowed, of course, were in Hershey, so Hershey Chocolate World, um, the country clubs have always been good. Nursing homes, we always have a, a contingency of students who are very, very interested in helping and working with the elder. And then we also have a contingency who say, oh, no, I don't ever want to go back there again. So it's very individualized, as you might imagine. Um, go ahead. Um, again, you know, the, the idea is that last semester, you know, they're very focused on that practicum experience, and we're looking at placing them in locations that um, have the uh, great potential of turning into paid employment. Go ahead. Um, golf. The, we had a student who was very successful at the... Um, uh, a local country club working in the golf center and got hired at that. Um, we, we've had students hired at Hershey's Chocolate World. Um, we have a student who was hired at a advertising agency last spring. So um, again, you know, the, the longer the program goes on, the more of those connections that you make and the more successful you are and the people, um, you know, the word gets out and people start to embrace what you're doing. So it's been wonderful. So uh, a big part of the program, again, as with all of uh, the, these programs, is inclusion into the higher education environment and being exposed to the social experience as well as the academic experience. Um, and we've had students who have been um, worked very closely with the athletics departments, and they've gotten very close to the teams and the players, and um, they've really uh, embraced those students, and it shows on campus whenever they see them or they're walking across the quad or, you know, they're in, in stacks having lunch. You know, the team players will come up and talk to them and high-five them, you know, all those great things, so... Um, okay, that's it. Next one. Whoops. So, are there any questions um, about the program? Make sure you repeat the question for the I'll, I'll the try week. to remember that. <laughs> Go ahead. Are you planning on repeating this kind of experience at Penn State out there or other places? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I know that uh, Penn State and State. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Are you planning on repeating? Um, this type of program, an inclusive higher ed program, at other Penn State locations. Um, I do know that Penn State State College here um, is working on a program right now. I believe they are starting this fall. I think they have a few students. Um, I don't know a lot about the, that program. Um, we are working with them and, you know, sharing whatever we can and trying to see how things work out. That's the only... Um, location that I'm aware of right now. I may be speaking and jumping out of my lane here, um, but I am a transition coordinator, but I am also a parent of a child with intellectual disability. Mm -hmm. My daughter was one of the two accepted into Penn State Maine working. Okay, great. So um, I can tell you that as I sit here and listen to all the talk, I, my heart is literally like ready to jump out of my chest because of the excitement and the that I see her experiencing as well as what we are experiencing. And, um, okay, our tuition is a little bit higher than <laughs> Well, it, uh, yeah, again, it's all different. You know, all our programs are a little different. Yes. 
Um, and so I am, I'm sure that has to do with the academic portion. So how many courses? Uh, Dr. Scututi and Fleming um, obviously are not here, and that's why I'm hoping I'm not speaking. No. Speaking no, speaking. thank you for, for contributing. But <laughs> and then we made her read it out loud because we're videotaping right. her. And um, there was a little bit of um, house shaking because of the jumping. I, I, and um, I get it. Stuff. But okay. I, would, I just wanted to, at this point, interject with Penn State, we are, um, that it is a very exciting time. If you have a student or your own personal child who gets into these programs, it is phenomenal. It, we, in fact, we come back in two weeks. Fabulous. Great. Now, thank you. Thank you for contributing. Congratulations. Any other questions? Is there any resident support? Um, our uh, campus does not um, currently have res the dorm option, residential option. Um, we do have off campus dorms that are. Uh, are is only allowed student housing, but they're not run by Penn State. Um, and we do have students who do live in the off-campus housing, but our program does not support them after program hours currently. Mm -hmm. and the, the, the oh, sorry, I forgot. So the, I'm sorry, the question was, um, does Penn State Harrisburg have residential, which is the dorm housing? No, we don't, but there are some options available there, but the program doesn't support it. And then um, State College also, um, their inaugural program is not currently offering the residential piece. Yeah. Um, it, I, I'm from Adams County. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, we have housing. Okay. Okay. Our, but our students do not have access to the housing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, there is housing at Penn State Harrisburg. Yeah. Yeah. That Early Reach um, Academy is going on right now um, for this year. So um, it's a busy time right there down at my campus. Okay. Thank you um, again. I'll, uh, Dan Danielle will be here for the rest of the conference. I'll be here for the rest of the day. Um, if you see me and you have thought of other questions, um, the handout has a lot of information, and then there's the link to the website. We're happy to speak with you um, and answer any questions. So thank you so much. Thanks, Bob. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies. Just sit there. You don't have to. <laughs> so you know, there's only about 260 colleges and universities in the United States, maybe 270 by now, that have such a program. And we're really, really, really new at this. And I'm glad the mother over here is willing to be a guinea pig at Slippery Rock. Um, we start out, you know, we are changing rules and guidelines every other week. And parents were really, really good about it, knowing that we're trying to improve the program every single semester we run the program. So thanks for being flexible up there at Penn State. And it's going to be valuable giving your input and getting um, changes as they see their, as they see to need to improve. Um, but that, uh, before I start Slippery Rock, I wanted to talk about parents for a minute. Some universities around the country don't ever interact directly with parents. Some go through the student to an email list and you had to go through all these different gyrations to get any feedback about your son or daughter. 
Um, I'm not sure about the other universities. We might bring it up a little bit later, but at Slippery Rock, um, after 30 years of teaching and never talking to a parent, because it's, it's the law at higher ed, you can't talk to parents, after that many years of dealing with non-parents, Rock Life came around and I was talking to parents four days a week. It's really changed everything around. And I, at first I was hesitant because I didn't know if it was right or we were allowed to do this. But eventually I realized we had to talk to parents of some of the students we had in our program to keep everybody on keel. So at Slippery Rock we do deal with parents directly. Um, our coordinators talk to parents. The director talks to parents. It's just part of the game as we're figuring all this out. And we'll ask the other schools how they do that a little bit later. So Slippery Rock, um, Rock Life began um, several years ago. We're in our fourth year. We've had no graduates. And if that sounds bad, but we started out as a two-year program like everybody else. And several years ago, everybody was a two-year program. I guess we thought that was about all we could handle. But after two years, most of the students in our program said, I don't want to leave. I know I have made friends here. I like going to college. I like living on the campus. And I want to stay two more years. So now we have a four-year program. And I'm sure that's the same story with most other universities that have housing or have gone from two to four-year programs. So we are a two to four-year program at Slippery Rock. Um, students enroll in anywhere from one to three classes, so two to six credits. Um, com commuters are permitted to take one class. If you're a resident, you need to take at least two classes. Many students are auditing the classes. About a third or more actually take some courses for credit, some courses for audit. And one of our students was um, bent on making sure he took all his courses for credit. And he did what I did as a freshman at college, didn't do so well. And your grade point goes down, and you've got to realize you better take different courses or figure out how to study and bring that, those courses up so you're not in probation anymore, just like anybody else under the sun going to college. And it was great. So he's doing well, and he'll graduate probably another semester or so. But yes, yeah, some students take classes for credit, some audit, some do a mix during the semester of both, depending on what the course is and what their interests are. Um, we actually have some students, um, we run a program called TAP, Transition Achievement Program, where 50 high school kids come to campus three days a week and we do transition services for four hours a day. Some of those transition students actually can take a course as a high school student um, as a precursor to see if they would be successful in college. So they take a course as a high school student before actually enrolling in Rock Life. So this is a little bit about the TAP program. It leads into our, um, re our Rock Life program, which is it's a good feeder system. Students spend four hours. They do some independent living skills. We have a nutrition education program at the, at the cafeteria. Um, and we have a physical activity component because we believe that if you're f active and healthy and learn how to eat well, you'll be a better employee, be a stronger employee, uh, miss less days of work, the whole bit. You know that story about healthy employees. So we have a very strong health promotion component to our transition program at the high school level. And the fourth component is job training at one of 30 sites on campus and off campus at many businesses in our small little community. Most of these students then, or a lot of these students then, have spent a couple semesters on campus and are very comfortable on the campus and know students because they've had mentors or whatever. And then they apply to be a Rock Life student at the college level. So it's a good feeder system into our program. So we do have individualized courses students take. They can take, uh, like I said, two to three undergrad classes. A lot of times they do the same courses some other folks talked about, the arts, the histories, the, some technology, uh, some early childhood, special ed. It's, it's just, it just depends on their interests and their ability. And um, so they do several courses a semester. When they complete 24 credits, either audit or for credit, they earn a certificate. Now, if you're in the state system, high, Pennsylvania state system of higher ed, like like uh, Slippery Rock and Westchester and Stroudsburg, you're not allowed to use the word certificate because the state system of higher ed uses certificate as a degree-seeking add-on. So we have an endorsement or a letter of completion, same thing as a certificate, but it, we're not allowed to use that word out of, the, out of Harrisburg's um, state system of higher ed's rules. But they earn a certificate endorsement at the end of 24 credits. If they choose to stay on, they add on to that, and then we'll graduate um, at the end of four years. Uh, like Simon says, we had 
um, administrative change, and it was a good change for us because the new president had a university in New Jersey where he had a program similar to Rock Life. He said, I don't know why students wouldn't be allowed to walk across the stage at graduation. And early on, we, that wasn't a possibility for our students. And he also said, I don't know why they couldn't work and earn money like any other student. Before he got there, they weren't allowed to take jobs away from full-time, full tuition paying students. Well, that's all changed now, thanks to administration. And we're really moving forward. Now our students can walk at graduation, which it should have all along, and can, can get jobs on campus like anybody else can get jobs on campus. Um, all students register with a disability services office, as, you, as most other universities require. We have one-on-one -on -one mentors. We have a team of mentors, um, some responsible for social, some responsible for the academics, the residential living, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. We have four main pillars. On the handout, you'll see four pillars. I'm going to add one to that pillar. The, under the social pillar, I would put social slash independent living. That's really a critical component. It wasn't on that list. And some things have changed since I left in, De in December. So it's been a whole semester of change with new direction, director at Rock Life. So I'm not up to speed on everything they've done. I can talk about past up to this point, mostly. But I would call it social slash independent living. And I'll talk about the independent living part. It's a strong part of our program. Um, we have a very unique housing um, situation at Slippery Rock. We have what's called LLCs, Living Learning Communities, and that's for every major on campus pretty much. If you're an education major, you live in a hall in a dorm with all education majors. If you're a history or a science or a biology major, you live on a dorm with all those majors. So you live and learn your major in that dormitory. So we have a Rock Life Living Learning uh, Hall in one of the main residence halls called uh, Watson Hall. And we don't just warehouse our Rock Life students in the hall by themselves. We have students from education, special ed, parks and rec, whatever interests they have, they want to re reside in a dorm with our Rock Life students. And they get a small stipend towards that um, uh, choice. So we have students with and without disabilities living on the Living Learning Rock Life Community Hall. So it's fully integrated. And the nice part about that is we have all the supports and the residence life assistance. They all have been trained and understand the uniqueness of those students on those halls in that particular hall or halls of Watson building. We have um, almost 20 students enrolled. We started with, I think, like Penn State main campus. We started with three. And we wanted a slow growth because it's very scary being a director and having students with intellectual or other development disabilities for the first time living away from home um, full time, day and night, weekends and you know, into the summer sometimes. So it was um, very nerve wracking for me to make sure safety was the first priority um, and that a successful program including education, academics, job training and the whole bit was all part of it. But now we're moved up this next fall, we'll have probably 15 to 18 and then we'll cap off at 20. And the administration is very happy with 20 students in a program, so we're good there, I think, as far as meeting expectations. And we'll actually have our first two graduates completing this next academic year, and we'll go through the whole graduation process, and that should be a real blast for our students. Our students do go through internships and job placements. We place the students in a job setting almost from the start, probably in the second semester on. They're working around town or in campus at one of the restaurants or hotels or on campus somewhere, one of the offices, and they work all through their four years, sometimes changing jobs if they're not happy with that particular choice. And then we've also placed a lot of our students into summer positions. And, and I'll give you a little tease here. Tomorrow we're doing a presentation about a program that's uh, job training called aquaponics. So we're raising fish and we're growing plants together in a beer canning facility using students with ID and developmental disabilities running the whole program for us and then getting jobs at the restaurant and the pub. If you want to hear more about that, come tomorrow at 11 o'clock. It's a really unique program. Tilapia fish, plants, and kids with disabilities. It's great. We'll hear more about that somewhere. So, um, I think that's all I want to talk about. Some of the information is on your handout. The contact is on your handout as well. 
Um, before I run through RAM for Westchester, which I really won't do much about, it's so new, I'll ta entertain any questions about the Rock Life program. Yes, ma'am. The TAP program is a transition program where, oh, the question was, I almost forgot, how do students get enrolled in the TAP program while they're in high school, correct? Yes. We work with um, Office of Vocational Rehab, yes. and we receive some grants early on. Now we're a provider for OVR, and so OVR gives us X number of dollars for the number of students we serve in a semester, and school, we contract with school districts, and we provide the schools those transition services they can't provide in such a rural environment that we have. It's hard to find a lot of job training opportunities in Slippery Rock. Yeah, for exactly. yeah, yeah, so you know what we face. So we work with schools, 10 different districts around us, and we provide, provide those services to students they select for the TAP program. Any other questions for Rock Life? Okay. Well, RAM is out of Westchester. It's a new program. I don't even know if they have started yet or are going to be starting this fall. They're moving, moving towards a residential component. They don't have one yet. Um, Two-year fully inclusive educational program, much like most other schools. They're starting out as a two-year program. They'll probably move to a four-year program once they get comfortable and the students don't want to leave after a couple of semesters. Um, it's fully inclusive. They've accepted three students so far, so it looks like they're just getting started. Peer mentoring, same as most other universities. And the focus is also academics, career skills, social and wellness and development, personal development. And there's some contact information. And here's the contact information. Anybody need that up there for the director and administrative director for Dream Partnership, if you're interested. If you have a son or daughter applying for a um, university that's funded by Dream, Dream will pay uh, or provide scholarships to that student, those students who apply for monies. And they don't receive the same amount every year. They receive a little bit less each year, but it sure does help with books and other things. So at this point, I'd like to bring some of the folks back up here. We'll entertain any generic questions or specific questions. One second, please. And um, come on up here. And you can ask any one of us a question from the different universities that have been here. And I have a question for some of the folks, too, as I've been listening to the different universities. So make sure you repeat the question if it's directed to us, and you can answer on your own. Any questions to anybody? We'll start in the back. The question was, why are most universities limiting the enrollment to 18 to 24 year olds and not higher? At Slippery Rock, we have taken students that are 25 or 26 years old. Um, I think that started out as a generic rule based on what main, typical college age range students were. But we soon learned that students um, who've been out of school for a while want to find something. And they've, we've accepted some of the older students into our program. So that's possible, at least at Slippery Rock. Anybody else? Yeah, exactly the same thing at Penn State Harrisburg, and I totally agree with Bob. I think that range was originally selected because that is a traditional college ra age range, but we, we've, select, we've had students in our program who were in their late 20s. We've even had some who were in their early 30s. So, uh, One option for a university that does not have an age range is uh, Lehigh Carbon Community College they do not have an age range for their program that I know of. And I agree with everything they said for us. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Um, so I work at a community college outside of Philadelphia, and a lot of times um, parents don't want the website link. Do you guys have literature that we could put out for parents to the time that they come in? We don't have a specific certificate program, and they are looking for that certificate program. Is there any way for us to get literature from you? The question is, is there um, information or literature to provide other folks to distribute materials about the colleges and opportunities for certificates, correct? Yes, sir. Anybody have an answer to that? 
Um, you, if you want to, you can just um, get on our website, send either Dr. Ren or myself an email, and I, we'll be happy to send you like that one one pager, or we also have a brochure um, as well, so I'm happy to send some of those. Probably everybody else's as well. Same for us. If, um, you're happy. If you email me, our director, or our real email address, we have a couple different documents about our program. Also, if you're interested in learning about all the programs in the state and around the country, you can go to thinkcollege.net, and they have a lot of different resources on their resource page there. Okay, great. Thanks. And that's the national organiza organization. Uh, same for us. If you take a look at our two-page flyer, we have some contact information on there with email addresses, and feel free to email them, and they can just shoot it right on over to you. But I was also going to say Think College is a really good resource as well. Also, dreampartnership.org for Pennsylvania specifically. So dreampartnership.org will be a, a site you can go to to find more information about all these schools that are funded in Pennsylvania. Any other questions? Yes. For students, for universities, not not providing housing, um, do any outside students come to those universities or how do they deal with students wanting to come to that university without the housing option? Uh, so again, for Penn State Harrisburg, um, our dorm, the dorm option isn't available for um, students who are admitted into our program, but we do have off-campus housing um, and the parents contact the off-campus housing directly and then, um, you know, figure out the support systems for the students that are in there. Excuse me, I got a <coughs> thing in my throat. Um, and then the parents are responsible for setting up some kind of supports for their students in that off-campus housing. <coughs> For Temple University, it's, it's, it's pretty much the same answer. We don't provide any residential uh, services for our students, but if they're interested in off-campus housing or apartments, the parents then are responsible for sort of looking into that um, and then providing those supports. Now, our staff would be as we're on campus, so we obviously would be available during the day if students were to ever need anything, but weekends and nights and stuff like that, the parents would be responsible for that. Anything else? Oh, I see a hand. Oh, we'll go over here first, then to the right. Are there support for transportation um, for students? Is there support for transportation for students? You mean trans commuting? Or there, is there support for commuting commuters to get back and forth to campus? For anybody? I know that, uh, at least for Temple, uh, because all of our students are currently commuting and most of them will take the train, um, some of them have been able to get their transportation pass to be covered by the waiver. Um, now that's something that they had to work with their supports coordinator for. Um, now we don't provide them that transportation, but at least that, that cost anyway was able to be supplemented. So we don't offer it. Um, are you in the Philadelphia area? So I know that SEPTA actually does have some training programs for that. Temple University doesn't offer it. Now we will help students sort of navigate where the train station is um, and sort of go over that with them. We just don't have anybody that would actually be on the train with them. First we'll, first we'll go over here and then to the back. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think if I if I lit, heard you right, you're asking me if Dream Partnership is looking into expanding the um, uh, population of individuals they're serving. You mean more universities, more funding, more schools, or more programs? Yeah. Yeah. 
It is, yeah. That. Right. So you're looking for um, programs that have more supports, a broader admission policy for different populations of students. Um, ID, but 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 a broader range within that category. Yes. Um, I know that Dream recently has been to um, Congress in Harrisburg and has requested state funding through appropriations for next year, a larger amount of funding for, from state funds. I don't know um, how much more, for instance, Slippery Rock could offer for um, health, more health care needs for students with more health impairments in addition to ID. Um, I'm not sure we could provide a safe environment or um, the su total supports that that would need. I'm not sure how that would work at Slippery Rock. Does anybody have a solution to that? Um, we currently have two students on our campus who have one-on-one -on -one supports, um, but that is also coming from their waiver funding. So we can accept students who necessarily don't just have ID. Um, they can have other disabilities as well, as long as they can't um, get into the normal college experience, you know, those SATs, ACT scores. But for the students with significant needs, if their waiver funding provides one-on-one -on -one support, they can have that on campus. Um, it's just that we personally don't provide one-on-one -on -one all day. Um, it's the peer mentoring support throughout the times that are selected. Yeah, and I would just add that we, um, we've had students who had nursing support as well but again that was provided through their county services one of our main requirements is that a student has to be able to navigate the campus so they have to be able at some point we provide scaffolding in our pyramid but they have to be comfortable going from building to building and place to place and um, so that's what we're really looking for okay thank you yes ma'am Can you repeat that, please? Okay. Okay. The question was, are any of the universities um, supportive of the foster care pro foster care and college program? I. I can't answer that for Slippery Rock. Are anyone familiar with that program? Yeah, no, just look into it. Now, it's something to look into if it's kind of new. Westchester is just brand new, so they're probably just on the edge of that right now, I would think. But thank you for the question. Yeah, but I have a question if there's none here. I have a question for the group. It, it really is kind of personal or of, of my interest. How many of your programs are near or fully self sustaining? And is that through the tuition and the fees charged primarily? Yes. Okay. So it seems like they're going to be around for a while. If they're self-sustaining, these university programs will be around. A lot of programs, when you start off, you're on grant money and borrowed time and energy, and it takes a while to become self-sustaining, so that's a good sign. Slippery Rock um, is probably breaking even now on being self-sustaining as well. Have any questions or comments? All right, well, thank you for attending. Um, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank All you.